It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Devant, one of the top accounting researchers in the world. Um, Mark is currently the Andy Morsich, a Chair Professor of Accounting at University of Southern California. Um, he has received numerous awards, including the notable contribution to the auditing literature. He is also one of the most cited accounting researchers in the world. And one thing I want to note is Mark is a dear friend of the UST community. He visited us two years, for two years during uh, his last previous uh, sabbatical leave from USC. We are thrilled to have him back this term again. Um, I'm sure you'll find his talk interesting, humorously insightful, and inspiring. Please join me in welcoming Mark Tifang. Thank you, Mingyi. That was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate that very much. So I guess I'd just like to start by uh, thanking the Institute for inviting me here and, and, and having me as a fellow for these three months while I'm here, uh, and thank the uh, faculty at HQST, the accounting faculty, for uh, welcoming me as, uh, on my sabbatical here for a second time. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome the any World Bachelor of Business students that are here today. Is that Anybody? Okay. They're probably going to watch the video later, uh, <laughs> if, it's if it's required for a class, maybe. But World Bachelor of Business, they, 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 they're USC here in HKST and also in Bocconi in Milan, where I'll be in a, a few months. Okay, so um, I was asked to give kind of a general talk as opposed to a technical talk, so I'll try not to get too technical. Uh, and I won't, I'll try to assume uh, not much accounting knowledge uh, as I go through this. And what I'd like to do is really, so I put together a talk that sort of summarizes some of the research uh, in accounting that I've done with um, uh, Ming Yi Hong, Professor Hong here at HKUST, and Su Chi Li, who's on her sabbatical from Santa Clara University, is also here. We've been co-authors for many years and are still doing work together. And uh, so I'll talk about uh, some of that research uh, as I go through. Um, OK, but before I get started on the Big Bang, I want to show you a picture. So this is a picture of a clay tablet, which is over 5,000 years old, I'm told. And this, was, this is inscribed with what uh, archaeologists call now as cuneiform writing. So it was a big mystery what all these uh, tablets were. They were like strewn all over uh, what's modern-day Iraq, used to be Mesopotamia. And they finally figured out what these are, and they call this writing cuneiform. Uh, and what do you think? So, and this is the earliest writing of human beings on the planet Earth. So people got together, figured out, hey, we can write things down, put them in these tablets, they'll last forever. What did people decide to write down? Accounting, of course. <laughs> you knew that was going to be the answer, yeah. So, so, I mean, I think if you didn't think accounting was important, well, I mean, hey. You know, I mean, we would, maybe we wouldn't have writing if it wasn't for accounting or, you know, Shakespeare, all that stuff. Anyway, so uh, this was uh, at some early evidence of accounting. So accounting isn't as old as the Big Bang, but it's, you know, pretty old. Um, but the accounting we have today is really about 500 years old. And it was developed in northern Italy, Florence and th that area during the Renaissance. And at that time, there was a big demand uh, company. People were getting together. A lot of wealth was building up. People were forming uh, companies. They needed to account for the wealth, sort of, you know, divvy up the profits, that sort of thing. So there became a demand for accounting around that time. And that's where the accounting that we see today really developed, so-called double entry accounting uh, with accruals. So this is, um, the system that we still use today. And this system has been around, like I say, for 500 years. So this is a, a graph of GDP, uh, growth per capita in GDP per person over the last 10 centuries. So we can see here the 14th century, this is when double entry accounting was invented. Now, I'm not sure you know, it caused that growth, right? <laughs> but you know, that's, there's a good association there, so you can tell a good story. Uh, 
But, you know, it was around there, and it was certainly helped responsible, right? So it was part of that whole process that created. And, and for humans, this was a big bump, right? Look, this is all, you know, Middle Ages. Things were negative. They're going downhill. Things turned around here. So it, it lasted through that, but then also through the Industrial Revolution, essentially the same system. Now the rules got more complicated, and, you know, the transactions got more complicated, and things evolved, of, of course. But it's the same debits, credits. Uh, assets, liabilities, revenue expenses that we have today. And then, of course, you know, it's lasted so far through whatever you want to call this revolution. I don't know if it's a computer revolution, the information revolution, whatever we have going on now, which is, you know, really uh, taken off, uh, you know, in terms of economic. So the idea here is that accounting has lasted and kind of persevered through a lot of economic growth and, and, and seems to have been useful. And we call it the language of business. So, you know, all business majors take this. We, we, it seems to be part of this whole part and parcel of, of this economic development. So that raises a natural question, and that is why? Why is accounting so durable? You know, what are, what are, the, what, what are the characteristics here that make this durable? We, we can look at a lot of things it does, but what is it about accounting? That, that makes it so useful or, or seem to be so useful. Um, you could ask that question, you could start a lot of places, but if accounting was, was demanded, started back in the, in, in, the, in the Renaissance, kind of as a result of wealth, we can, you know, one place to look to kind of think about this is wealth around the world. So here's a heat map of approximately today, I think, of the GDP uh, per person, per capita, per country. So this is divvied up by country. And um, you can see the darker colors are the more uh, wealthier countries, and the lighter colors are the poorer countries. So uh, there's a few patterns here, but one that, that pops out is kind of along the equator. Uh, there's not as much wealth as in more temperate climates. So kind of one story that evolves from this that economists tell is that in the tropics, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, chronic uh, illness, uh, the weather's not so good, it's kind of harder to get things uh, going there, uh, harder to get things sort of business going, economic development. Now, I don't think money is everything, I don't think GDP is everything, but countries pay a lot of attention to GDP and GDP growth. And it seems to be a very important objective of many countries. Now, money isn't everything. Happiness might be everything. But we know that this GDP growth, and I certainly don't think it's everything, but we know this GDP and GDP growth is associated with some good outcomes, like better health care, uh, better nutrition. And one way that expresses itself that we can see very vividly in a picture like this is infant mortality rates. So this is the how many children die in the first year of life. We can see in richer countries like the U.S. and Italy, I'll use those examples because of the World Bachelor of Business people, uh, who, who I'm sure will watch this. Uh, you know, the numbers are pretty low. The numbers are pretty low. A lot of people die. But if you go down into the tropics now, we have one in 10 children dying before they reach the first uh, age one. Right? So this is one sort of you know, indicator of the benefits. But of course, this can't be the whole story. Here's Hong Kong. Hong Kong's in the tropics. Now they're, you know, they're like Italy or the US in terms of low infant mortality rates. So there's obviously lots of other things going on. And there's a whole branch of economics that tries to explain economic growth. And they go back to these very fundamental factors that they call institutions. And the institutions are these, in, these, these things that, that, that aren't really choices that, that countries make. You know, geography, you don't get to choose where you are. Now, I mean, there is a little bit of that with, with countries taking over other countries, but, but generally speaking, it, it, you, know, you don't choose where you're. And the same thing with your history. So for example, uh, if you were colonized by Great Britain and the strong rule of law, you, know, you have certain institutions of ways of doing business and, and could, in your behavior that are a little different than, say, if you were colonized by Spain and, you know, like Mexico, and a little more laid back about the rules, right? It's just a cultural thing that just emanates from many, many different things. So there's lots of these historical things. Religion seems to make a difference. There's lots of these, these things that aren't really choice variables, right? These institutions that, 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 that countries have. And these institutions, you can say, form how, the comp how these companies govern the businesses that develop. So as economic development goes up, or, or, or is created, these institutions influence how they're organized. 
And then <clears throat> that leads to something called capital market development, which has been much studied uh, in financial economics. And this is you know, how much people use stock markets and how successful these markets are in allocating resources. And then, of course, we get down to the punchline here, and that's GDP growth. Right, so GDP growth is, is down at the bottom. We've just talked about how important that is. So where does accounting fit into the chain here? Well, the accounting kind of about right here. So accounting, I would argue, and I think it's pretty not non-controversial, you can look at it as a part of, or a, 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 a part of the package of corporate governance. So this is the way countries uh, govern their businesses, okay? So um, now that raises a question then, another question here, and that is why is corporate governance important, right? How does that fit into this? Accounting fits into corporate governance. What does governance fit? What does that fit into things? Well, corporate governance is important because CEOs use other people's money. So uh, you know, we, we have this issue where, you know, companies need investment and, uh, you know, to, to, to fund projects and that sort of thing. And uh, owners invest, get equity shares. Uh, lenders lend money, get a promise to get some payment back with some interest. Uh, but the whole thing revolves around, uh, at least in the modern era, giving strangers your money. And that is inherently risky. We know that's risky. Our parents teach us to worry about strangers, and we're giving money to strangers. So this is uh, Jensen and Meckling call this the agency problem. That we've got this this uh, manager who we give money to, and their interests are a little different than ours, and uh, they aren't going to take care of our money the same way we might take care of it ourselves. So that creates a, a, a problem. Now in the U.S., of course, we thought you know. We have laws that'll protect us from things like this and governance. Now, in the modern age, we're not so sure about that anymore, but, uh, but that, hopefully that'll pass. Okay, so um, what is corporate governance then? So the word's bandied about a lot. I don't think there's any real definition that, that everybody agrees upon, uh, but if we look at the problem that it's trying to overcome with other people's money, a really nice definition has come up. Uh, Schleifer and Vishni came up with it, some, some uh, economists, uh, ways in which suppliers of finance guarantee themselves of getting a return on their investment. Very simple, straight to the point, very general as well. So, and I think it fits in nicely with this accounting. So accounting, I think you can kind of look at as part of this mechanism of how investors try to figure out if they're getting a return on their money or how to get a return on their money. Um, but what does exactly accounting do uh, to achieve this? So let's start off by asking another question, and that is, what is the role of stock markets? What are the role of capital markets? So accounting is an important role, important, important feature there. So we can think about the role of capital markets. So capital markets, I think, stock markets, are places that provide capital and investing. So companies have projects they want funded, they need money, and they have investors with money they want to invest, get those people together, that's what the stock market does. So what role does accounting play in stock markets? How does accounting fit into this whole thing? What role does accounting play? Anybody? I mean, I guess I'll talk for an hour and then I think we're gonna have Q&A, but okay, let me tell you the answer. So stock, the, the, the idea is accounting, is should help investors identify the best investments, right? They should say, hey, look, here's the company that's doing well, performing, show the performance of the company, the value of the company, is the company undervalued, is it overvalued? So that's kind of the, the role we think about accounting uh, in these stock markets. Um, so accounting then, we can say, and I would generalize from this, and I think it's a good way to characterize what is accounting, what's the objective of accounting? So what do we want accounting to do? Accounting, I think a good definition here, is efficient resource allocation. Accounting helps users figure out where to put their money. So this idea in, in, in you know, uh, 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 economies for, uh, you know, to, to have efficiency, 
assets have to be put, investments have to be put to their highest use, right? This is how we, we have economic growth. So accounting then uh, facilitates this process of investors finding the best places to maximize wealth. Uh, but the problem with this, of course, is this is our objective, but it's not always achieved, right? So some accounting systems are better at this than others. Now, we got a really interesting anecdote on this a few years ago that I think just kind of it makes this a very salient point. So a few years ago, Daimler-Benz, the company that makes uh, Mercedes-Benz cars, uh, needed capital. There wasn't uh, enough capital. There wasn't a lot going on in Germany at the time, and they needed some investment. The U.S. has the biggest, most liquid, deepest capital markets, so all this money sloshing around in the U.S. They wanted to jump in, get some investors to, to, to fund some of their projects, so they decided to list in order to raise capital in the U.S. capital markets. Now, the trick here is that at this time, if you wanted to list in the US and you were a foreign company, I mean, that's fine, everybody's welcome, but you had to use US accounting principles. So the idea is the US, the, 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 the Security Exchange Commission required this governance. You, you must adopt the governance systems in the US, including the use of accounting standards. Now, everybody at the time suspected that German general accepted accounting principles gap were not very good at informing investors. Some clues to that were the stock markets were really small and people didn't use them very much. It's mostly bank financing and things like that, right? So private individuals helping, you know, getting together with the company rather than big markets. Uh, but here we got for the first time in history a chance to actually see a set of financial statements prepared under German GAAP versus US GAAP. So, Daimler-Benz had to prepare their financial statements under German GAAP, and they reported 615, about a half a billion dollars in U.S. dollars in profit that year. Now they took the exact same transactions for the exact same year, of course it's the same company, and they converted it to U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, and they had almost a $2 billion loss. So, you know, something strange here, right? So something's, something's funny here. So this is a clue that there, there's some big differences. And the startling, I think probably the most smart, startling thing here is, this is Germany, right? This is one of the biggest economies in the world. And their capital bar, their, their, their accounting systems, something seems a little fishy here. So this was uh, an interesting clue into the fact that there are big differences. But that's an anecdote, of course. And eventually then, more recently, researchers uh, have collected rigorous systematic evidence on differences in the capital market consequences or the features of different uh, accounting systems uh, in different economies. An early pioneer in this area is Mingyi Hung. So Mingyi, back when she was, uh, one of her first papers, she was doing her doctorate at M MIT, she systematically examined the usefulness of accounting earnings, right? So it's with this usefulness, do market participants use accounting earnings? So she used a measure of usefulness that, that, that's quite commonly used, and that is, do, does the stock, value relevance it's called. And the idea is when we see a change in accounting earnings, do stock prices change? Similarly, are they correlated? Are the changes in accounting earnings correlated with the changes in the stock price? If they are, then that's consistent with the accounting earnings representing something that the investors think is value, it reflects value. And it's also consistent, although it's a step or two away, from the market using that information. So what did she find? So this is a, a test of whether or not the counting numbers map into the stock market. So what did she find? Well, she found that there's quite a bit of difference. These are descriptive statistics from that paper. And she found that, for example, the US was quite high as you stack this up. And countries like Italy were lower down the peg. And someplace in the middle were, was Hong Kong. So this is more rigorous systematic evidence that stock markets seem to use the information or react to, or the accounting information reflects a different uh, ask, or, or it, it explained more or less of the uh, stock price change or the value of a company in different, different countries. So um, 
this provided strong early evidence of these systematic differences. Um, so in a later study then, in a later study, a couple of years later, we, I, got, I joined a paper with Ming-Yi Hung and uh, a co-author uh, from USC, who, uh, Bob Trezevant, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And we wanted to get a little more direct evidence on the usefulness of accounting and markets. So what did we do? We looked at the stock market, the variation in stock returns around the day that companies announce their accounting earnings. So the idea is if, if, if investors are using that accounting information to buy and sell stock, you would see the stock price moving around more on days when accounting information comes out. So this study tried to kind of a little more direct test on the usefulness part of this. So what did we find? Well, we found that the US, there's quite a bit of a, of a reaction in Italy, a bit less, and Hong Kong up, up there near the uh, there. So again, more evidence that there are these differences across these markets in terms and these countries in terms of the accounting information and how it maps into the uh, into the uh, value of the company. But the real objective of these, I've shown you some descriptive statistics. The real objective of these papers was to really ask why we had these differences, right? So that was the real objective here. So without going through a lot of the evidence, what is the answer? Well, the answer seemed to come out to be institutions matter a lot. So these very basic factors that lead to the governance system in, the comp in, the, in these countries seem to have a very big explanatory effect on which countries uh, stock markets reflected the accounting information. So we looked in the study we did uh, that I, I just mentioned to you, we can see that in a, a particularly this, char this characteristic called investor protection, which is really the laws and the, uh, and the institutions in place to assure that shareholders get their money back. So what we find is that in weak, in stronger investor protection countries, the amount of information uh, in, the, in the accounting earnings reflected in stock price was higher, and it got into that stock price higher. And this is very consistent with many studies that were done around this time that looked at these cross-sectional associations between stock prices and uh, the accounting earnings. Okay, so the question we ask there is, what matters? Institutions matter. And a lot of people kind of stopped here and said, gee, okay, institutions matter, we'll throw up our hands. You know, countries develop endogenously their own accounting systems, and so whatever they have is probably best for them. But there was some evidence that accruals did matter. And in the paper I mentioned earlier that Ming-Yi did, a, a, a striking result in that paper is that accruals seem to matter. Now, what do I mean by accruals? Well, accruals are what accounting is. Accountants make accruals. We are accrual-making animals. This is, this is how we, this is what we do. And what are accruals? I, I, I'm not gonna get into all the details here, but generally speaking, we look at the checkbook and cash goes in and cash goes out and it's paid for this and it's paid for that. And cash flows are what investors want. This is why people invest in companies. They want cash, right? You've got to get cash, you want a dividend, you want to get a payoff at some point. But what accountants try to do is try to measure performance for a given period. And that doesn't always map very well into the cash. So what Luca Pacioli back in the you know, 14th century was doing was taking that cash flow and saying, hey, wait a minute now, here's the cash for the period, but we have some expenses, we have the utility bill, we haven't paid that yet, and that's gonna hit this period. Or we've got a sales commission we haven't paid yet. Or you know, think about all the things we haven't paid, right? So you accrue expenses. And these are just two examples of accruals, by the way. Or revenues, hey, we made a big sale, this, this, this month, we've, we've shipped the merchandise, we've, you know, the inventory's gone out, we paid the, the salesman their, their, their commission, but we haven't received the cash yet. So this doesn't tell us much about really the performance of the company during the period. 
it's important, right? We want to keep track of the cash, right? We definitely. But he doesn't tell us performance. So the accountants make these accruals and come up with something called accounting earnings. And there's a million more of these things. There's lots and lots of these accruals. So let's see. So this is the idea is that this, this makes a difference. Now, Ming Yi's paper suggested it did, and we can look at the, you know, kind of the scientific evidence there. But there's also anecdotes are quite um, powerful like the anecdote I showed you a few minutes ago with, with, with uh, uh, Daimler-Benz. So let me, let me show you an anecdote of, of um, Walmart uh, a couple of years ago. Okay, so Walmart goes global. So this is a time in Walmart's history when their stock price, this is a 10-year period, went from $5 to $20. So it quadrupled in value. And this is, you know, part of the, over this period, you know, a lot of things were going on at Walmart. They were expanding, expanding globally. And, you know, the history of Walmart, they didn't do that well at first, but then they did, and then they pulled back. And they, so they're a little slow to this. I mean, it's obviously a very successful company, but, you know, they had some ups and downs here. So this is the stock price. Good time to own Walmart quad, stock price quadruples. So that's the stock price. That's what investors take all the possible information they can get and say, hey, you know, this big markets, hey, this is what the company's worth. But now let's look at the cash flows over this period. And these are the free cash flows, the, the cash flow called cash flows that, that pay dividends. We can see that it's actually negative over most of this time period. So the cash flows don't tell you, they don't map into the value of the company over that time period very much. In fact, if you try to present value this, I mean, any reasonable horizon, you know, it would be, it would be tough, right? You'd be selling Walmart short. So what does the accounting numbers look like over this time period? Like that. So the accounting, and you can see that stock price just kind of snakes around that, that accounting number, right? It just doesn't want to get too far away. So one reason you see this big drop here is because Walmart was going global. So they were investing a lot of cash in building stores and putting inventory in those stores in China and Mexico, around the world. And the accountant said, yep, yeah, you know, that's, that's cash out, but you know, that's a good cash out. That doesn't reduce earnings, right? So we're not gonna penalize earnings for the cash you pay to generate revenues in the future. We'll put that on the balance sheet as an asset, and then we'll expense it when you produce those revenues. So the accountants go through all this math of trying to figure out, arithmetic rather, of trying to figure out, you know, when, you, when is this stuff gonna pay off? So that's why we get this big difference here. And it just kind of underscores this idea that the accounting earnings are really trying to capture the value of the company, right? This is, this is the objective here. And accountants pull their hair out trying to think of all these accruals uh, to get there. Okay, now, in the late 1990s, um, a lot of things happened. And there was kind of a confluence of events. That's Suchi there. She's got to go, <laughs> got to run. Okay. Um, There's kind of a confluence of events that uh, created a demand for a worldwide system of accounting. So one big factor here going on in the late 90s was some of this stuff I showed you with Walmart, globalization. So multinationals began you know, crossing a lot of borders, uh, going into a lot of countries. Uh, a lot of countries were kind of getting to figuring out you know, how to develop their economies. Uh, and there was a demand for accounting for this. But the problem is everybody spoke a different language, right? So you had different accounting systems like we, we saw with Germany in different countries. So there was a demand to have you know, one single accounting system that could be compared across countries. So investors could take a company in Germany and compare it to one in, in the US or, or, or whatever without actually changing to those accounting methods or going to the US to list. So they wanted a system that would allow comparison, right? This is really driven by analysts. This is driven by investors who wanted this information. So that led to the creation of the International Accounting Standards Board which then led to the accounting big bang. So IFRS are International Financial Reporting Standards. And this organization called IASB, International Accounting Standards Board, developed these standards in the early 2000s, but they really go back many decades, but they kind of got, got serious about making them good standards in the early 2000s. And 
the idea was to create a set of accounting standards that would allow comparability. If you can increase this comparability, the benchmark you have for your investment, that should reduce, that should reduce investors' costs, give them comfort they're making the right bet on that firm, and reduce the cost of capital for the company. And that should also increase foreign investment. So increased comparability would allow smaller countries, smaller companies to attract foreign investment. So that's kind of the idea. So who are the beneficiaries? Who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of IFRS? Well, I, I, I don't think you know, anyone was not supposed to benefit. But if you look at the International Accounting Standards Board and claims about IFRS, one big beneficiary should have been, or is supposed to be, these countries that don't have big, nice corporate governance systems like in the US and other developed economies. So less developed economies with weaker institutions. This was a way, it was kind of marketed as a way to kind of get you know, governance off the shelf, right? You don't have an, you have an economy that doesn't allow you to develop this fancy, sophisticated financial infrastructure that allows all these great accounting methods to be, you know, system to kind of develop in your economy. Well, we'll make that for you. You buy, you get it from us. And we also get this comparability in the whole deal. So this was kind of the, uh, in essence, they were marketing governance. But the other thing that happened here too, here's, an, here's a map of, of, of the IFRS adopters today. So as of today, it looks like about 138 out of 100 and I don't know, 90 or so countries, sovereign countries now use IFRS. And those are the, the blue countries. Nine of the top 10 capital markets use IFRS. Who do you think the loan holdout is? <laughs> the US, exactly. The US, and you know, we don't use a metric system either. So, <laughs> so we're kind of an entity into ourselves. Uh, but the US doesn't use, use this, but I, I also want to point out that we're not the only ones who don't use it. North Korea doesn't use it either. And neither does Afghanistan, right? So, you know. I don't know, maybe this is a new ally of ours. I don't, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what happens in the next couple of months. Um, but anyway, but, but more importantly, I think for researchers, this was the biggest event in the history of, of accounting, right? So this is, this is the biggest thing that ever happened in accounting. So we had dozens of, of uh, countries and thousands of companies on midnight to the stroke of 12 on December 31, 2005, bang, you switch to a new accounting system. And we know from research like Mingyi's and others and stuff we followed up that there's a lot of difference in these accounting systems. And now everybody's, got, so we'll see, we can look at all these countries and all these companies in all these countries and see what happened when suddenly their financial report comes out and it's got a different accounting system. So this pr pr created what would sometimes researchers call qu a quasi-natural experiment. It's archival data. It's historical, right? We can't change it. We can't change who gets, who gets IFRS and who doesn't. So we'll never be able to infer causality, really. But the idea, we want to get more than just these associations. We want to get cl closer than we've gotten in the past. So the idea, by having a shock, by having this event, that at least many of the companies in the economies didn't ask for or cause this exogenous shock gave researchers an opportunity to see what happens here. So the previous studies I had shown you were association studies. So the problem with association studies is these are cross-sectional association studies. Association doesn't mean causality. If you can see an event and then see the reaction, you can get a little closer to that. And that, so that's the, the idea. Okay. Um, so, but now that I've built up this quasi experiment, let me step one step back and say, you know, we, we did another paper in 2007 that said, you know, well, before this big adoption was coming, what, what do we know about country companies that voluntarily adopt this fancy accounting system, this sophisticated accounting system? So before we jumped into that, the Big Bang, we, we, we kind of did a baseline study that looked at what happens to companies beforehand. And we could see that after adopting, voluntarily adopting IFRS, these companies 
tended to attract more foreign investment. So this study was looking, we had a kind of a unique database of 25,000 mutual funds, which was a new database at the time. So we could look at foreign investment in a country, in a company rather, after, before and after they had adopted IFRS. So we could test this truth in advertising from the ISB. Does adopting IFRS really attract foreign investment? And here's the you know, cross-sectional. We also looked at the change, what happened when companies changed from one to the other. We found a similar result. In other words, there was a, a, a significant increase in foreign investment. So here's some evidence then that this increase occurs. But of course, we wanted to know in this study, what is it about the accounting in IFRS that seems to create this demand? What is it that foreign investors like about IFRS that they weren't getting in the accounting standards locally for that country? And what we found is that a big factor, the primary factor that explained this voluntary adoption is disclosure and transparency. In other words, if you disclosed more information, if you were more transparent with your accounts, more stuff being communicated to investors compared to the local gap, the bigger the bump from the foreign investors. That explained a lot of this. And in fact, this increase in disclosure can be seen with the naked eye. Right? You don't have to do a study. So some documented that the financial reports for these companies increased by up to 60% over this period, right? So huge increase in just the volume of information investors were getting. So then we moved on uh, to look at, at what we really wanted to look at, and that is the uh, mandatory adopters. So because the problem with voluntary adopting, of course, is this is just a voluntary choice. We, we still can't make this causality argument because it could be that it, it may have nothing to do with the accounting. It could just be that good companies signal their type by adopting these accounting methods. In other words, if the accounting doesn't change them, they're the ones that get the accounting, right? They don't have nothing to hide, so they adopt these methods. It, it still says something positive, perhaps, about voluntary IFRS adoption, that it may allow signaling, that mandatory adoption would erase, but nevertheless, so we look at, it's important to look at the mandatory adoption if you want to make uh, stronger statements. Okay, so in another study, uh, Mingyi and I joined up with Su Chi, who just left. Uh, Su Chi was a graduate student at the University of Washington, or excuse me, the University of Southern California, uh, with Mingyi and I, and uh, we hooked up with her and did a study looking at this, this, the adoption. What happens to these companies? And we were specifically interested in comparability. So we found in the other study that seemed to attract foreign investment, but does comparability matter? So the, 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 this, again, kind of a truth in advertising. So we focused on comparability. And what we found is that before mandatory adoption and after mandatory adoption, again, there was an increase in the foreign investment in the IFRS adopters the average effect was much smaller. But one reason that average effect was much smaller is there was a big if on whether or not mandatory adoption actually resulted in an increased interest from foreign investors. And some companies benefited much more than others. And the diff big difference fell along the lines of comparability. So if there was a inc big increase in comparability, foreign investors jumped in much more than if there was a, a small increase in comparability. So let me show you what I mean by comparability in an accounting sense. So here's the European Union. This study looked at the European Union. Here's all the countries in the European Union. So overnight, all these companies adopted IFRS. So 82 companies in the petroleum industry adopted IFRS. In Denmark, how many petroleum companies were there? One. There was one petroleum company, it's a little country. So what happened to the comparability of that petroleum company after IFRS adoption? Well, now you had 82 different companies to benchmark it against. Before, they were using Danish Gap, and there was only one of them. So there was nobody to compare with. So overnight, you get this tremendous ability to benchmark 
that that investment? Is that company's performance? How does that company's performance stand up to others in its industry? You can contrast that with the United Kingdom. Lots of petroleum companies in the United Kingdom. 19, and some of them quite large. So before IFRS adoption, they had a lot of benchmarking to do already. So their gain from these additional benchmarking was relatively small compared to the Denmark, Denmark company. So now we have a situation where these smaller countries did seem to have a differential benefit over the larger countries in uh, IFRS adoption. Okay, so, but there's bad news in this picture. We found that comparability improved this or attracted these foreign investors, but if you didn't have reliable accounting, we looked at this income smoothing score. So this is a measure of the extent to which managers seem to kind of manipulate earnings just to get a nice smooth pattern of earnings, manipulate the accruals to get a nice smooth pattern. And what we found is that if you didn't have, if you're below the median, you didn't manipulate earnings much in your country, you benefited. But if you're in a country where there's a lot of manipulation, you had no benefit at all, period. So IFRS seemed to work here, but not here. So countries like Italy, for example, you know, it's sort of like good accounting just won't solve the problem in Italy. Right, it's, the, the economy has some problems, the accounting has some problems, just getting a fancy new set of accounting standards isn't gonna do it. The problems are deeper, the problems are with the institutions. So this was a little bit of a depressing result because with a few exceptions, the countries that needed the benefit from IFRS the most, you know, the Spains, the Italy's, Greece, these countries didn't get any benefit. And the companies, countries that got the most benefit were the richer countries, the countries with good institutions. So the countries that IFRS was supposed to help, it wasn't doing so good. So the kind of the rich get richer and the poor get poorer kind of a story. Um, the last study I wanna talk about is a study that gets into some uh, debates in accounting about what the right accounting is. So the idea here is to try to figure out what are the characteristics of accounting from this big bang that make accounting useful to investors. Well, there are two religions uh, in accounting. Um, one is the religion of valuation and one is the relig religion of contracting, okay? So the idea here is what should accounting be helpful the most in? Valuing the stock, directly making a line between the stock price and the accounting numbers, that's what I've been talking about mostly. Or there are other roles for accounting. So we know the other roles in contracting are in, for example, loan agreements. So it's common to have financial covenants in loan agreements that give an early warning to lenders if something goes wrong in the company. It's also common to use almost all countries, uh, almost all companies have contracts with their management that ties their bonus, their cash bonus, to accounting numbers. So there's this contracting role for accounting. Now, there are two different kind of extremes in how we measure the inputs to the accounting system. One is to use market values, current market values. Right, here's the, here, you know, there, here's a, there's, there, there's a building on the balance sheet. What, what value do we put in that building? Well, the valuation story would say market values. That's the relevant number. But the contracting story would say, well, we're kind of trying to follow where the money went. These investors gave the, share, gave the uh, company money, and where did they spend it? So the historical cost numbers seem to, the arguments are, fit better with this contracting story. And in fact, when you look back at the origins of accounting, back in the, the, the Renaissance period, it was primarily for this contracting, right? We didn't have big markets. The valuation role wasn't there. It was really this contracting, this stewardship role for accounting that, that, that this talks about. 
So this creates a big friction. Critics of the market value or, or, or proponents of market value say, hey, those are more relevant for valuation. Critics say they're less reliable. Historical cost is more reliable. Why, we got a receipt. We know exactly how much management paid for that thing, as opposed to trying to figure out a market price, especially for assets that aren't readily traded, like buildings and land and things like that. So IFRS tends to focus on market values. They've taken a decidedly valuation approach. So there's a concern that perhaps they've fallen down in meeting the needs of the parties that are contracting with them. So we did a study recently, this is a working paper we have now, and we try to measure the usefulness of accounting in contracting in executive compensation contracts. So there's a very well-known result in the literature, and that is that when accounting earnings go up, bonuses tend to go up. When accounting earnings go down, they go in the other direction. So bonuses tend to be, the change in earnings tend to be related to what managers receive as their bonus. So we look at this sensitivity, this so-called pay performance sensitivity, right? How sensitive is the, is the bonus to changes in accounting earnings? And what we find is that if you adopt IFRS, and the fair value provisions, right, the ones that, that they lean towards, don't affect you very much, then yes, indeed, the sensitivity of your stock, of, of the bonus for the manager, increases significantly after IFRS, IFRS adoption. That's consistent with IFRS, all this disclosure and greater comparability and all those things we've been talking about. But if there are lots of fair value Adjustments to your accounting numbers from IFRS, if there's lots of those, then boom, it actually goes down. In other words, the earnings become less useful in determining how management performed. So they may help you with the stock price, but the link to manager, it gets a little bit lost. So IFRS improves pay performance sensitivity, but only when these fair value changes are quite low. And the benefits from more disclosure under if are off. So this is it, it, it consistent with IFRS helping, but these fair value adjustments actually offsetting that, taking away the good stuff. But there's bad news in this study too. And bad news in this study kind of mirrors the bad news in the last study I told you about. If you look at the regulatory quality, so this is the in the, the institutions in that country that help assure those accounting numbers are reliable, then what we find is that this improve, this regulatory quality drives the effect from IFRS. In other words, if you have low regulatory quality, you don't get that bump, even if you have low fair value changes. There's no benefit to this adoption of IFRS from, in terms of the pay performance sensitivity. So it's only countries, again, that tend to be, have better institutions. So it's kind of the same story again, and harkens back, really, to these old association studies. These institutions seem to be a very dominant feature uh, in the landscape. So we can see Italy there on the uh, low end, Hong Kong on the high end. So why does accounting matter? Well, I mean, just to kind of summarize a couple of the things, uh, accruals matter. So this was great news for accountants, I'll have to say, right? Because this is what we do. And, you know, trying to find external validation that this is, you know, good across, you know, different uh, uh, jurisdictions is, was reassuring. Um, disclosure matters, right? Disclo I mean, maybe not a surprise, but the more you can tell investors about the company, the more you open up and become transparent, the, 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 the accounting system, the better off we are. Comparability, so the ability to benchmark against other uh, companies is important. Historical costs, 
Now, we did a study on, we, you know, this working paper on pay performance sensitivity. There are also papers that look at debt contracting, and they seem to find similar results. In other words, debt contracts, once you adopt IFRS, less likely, if you, if you adopt a lot of IFRS prisons, less likely to be used as covenants. Financial uh, covenants are less likely to be used. Uh, and, you know, the thing that kind of dominates all of this is this reliability, which really goes to the institutions, right? The, the good accounting won't help you if you don't have the institutions that implement it reliably, right? It's just not going to help. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. And then, you know, there's lots and lots of consequence studies, uh, some of which we've done, uh, for IFRS. Like, you know, what, what are they... What are the capital market consequences of this IFRS adoption? And we can see lots of things. So lower cost of capital, uh, increased liquidity, those are related. Uh, lower risk of stock price crashes. That's a, another thing. So they're less likely to fall off the cliff. Again, this is about information and the ability to this disclosure is consistent with increased transparency. Uh, increased analyst following and accuracy. Uh, increased management forecasts. Increased earnings usefulness. But of course, not everything is good, and we have increased costs of borrowing. So the contracting side seems to be the part that kind of gives up here a little bit, right? So the, the, the contracting side, okay? And then impaired executive performance evaluation. These two are the, both the contracting part. Okay, so, but the overarching thing again, none of this stuff makes that much difference unless you have reliability. In, in reliable uh, institutions, right? So that kind of dominates, again, uh, all of these results. So going forward, um, you know, there, I think there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of open questions, a lot of open issues, some things going on. So let me just, and maybe this will, will help uh, with some discussion too. There's some irony here. Uh, and, and, and that is that, and one irony anyway, is that, Resilient result, again and again. Strong investor protection matters. But if we look at the biggest accounting frauds, these tend to be in high investor protection economies. And there's even evidence, albeit somewhat limited, that there's more earnings management happens in higher investor protection economies, right? I mean, there's, there's some evidence of that. So what's going on there? I mean, this, the, the, the story looks like an incentive story. In other words, if I'm in an economy where the investors value the accounting information, and I'm a manager, and I know they're going to rely on my accounting information, I have a much bigger incentive to play around with those accounting numbers than I'm in an environment where nobody cares about the accounting. So if nobody cares, uh, nobody's going to cheat either, right? So uh, we come up with this kind of uh, apparent contradiction here. What is the effect of IFRS on auditing? You know. The, the, one of the resilient results, of course, here is these, are these institutions. And these institutions have a lot to do with the auditing, right? This is the enforcement. This is making sure management is presenting numbers, choosing gap. Generally accepted accounting principles allow lots of choices. Comparability is not uniformity. Uniformity means everybody does the same thing. Comparability means I can compare things that are alike, and I can see when things are different. That allows a lot of discretion by managers in which account, you know, how they interpret gap. You know, there, there are lots of possibilities under generally accepted accounting principles. Managers are supposed to choose the application that best maps into their underlying economics, that faithfully represents the performance of the company. Who's checking that? Those are the auditors. The audit opinion says, are the financial statements fairly presented? That's the whole point. So they're looking over management's shoulder to make sure that happens. So I think, I mean, this, this is clearly an important uh, piece of the economy here. We haven't had a lot of research on that, some research. But we, we know that there's a, this is kind of a, a lot of landmines in IFRS because if you're an auditor, we know from the U.S. fair values are inherently difficult to audit. I mean, if you're talking about fair value of, you know, a share of stock in Microsoft, that's easy. But if you're talking about the fair value of the building, the, the, you know, that the, the uh, steel mill sits on, or the value of the, you know, land where it doesn't trade, 
or, asset, or other assets that are just not readily tradable. Then you, there's a lot of guesswork in coming up with those fair values. So the auditors don't seem to be, get this very well. The other thing is IFRS is principles-based. The the, you could fill this room with interpretations of the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the US. So they come up with a set of rules, they say, okay, and here's how to interpret it, and here's how to interpret it. In other words, it's almost like the IRS code in some ways. Lots of help in getting it. The IFRS has said, we are not going to get into this game. Here's the principle, right? You want to fairly present, and here's kind of what we're, what we're looking for. You figure out how to implement it. So there's a lot of discretion in exactly how to implement this IFRS. This creates a problem for auditors. Because now the auditor goes in and says, hey, geez, I, you know, I'm not really sure. What do, you, what do you guys think? And now you've got four. And we also have a situation where we have four large auditing firms in the world, each one looking at these IFRS standards, trying to figure out how to interpret them. If they're not talking, you could end up with four different set of accounting standards, right, at least. So that's an issue. Complexity, a lot more disclosure, just a lot more stuff to do. Right? A lot more places to trip up and get it wrong. So the auditing, this is, like I say, landmine for auditors, uh, IFRS. Um, the other thing that comes up that you have to kind of ask yourself is, and, and some people have asked, I mean, do you want one standard setter for the entire world? I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, you know, we usually think competition is good. But of course, we don't want to compete on, say, the width of railroad tracks, you know, across states. You know, get to the border, you have to. I think there's some country that's like that, right? You have to pick the train or change trains, right? So the uniformity, or, or, or you know, this st standardization rather, is good in some places. Um, but one of the things that's happening, and I, I, you know, some people call it a crisis. It might be a little, uh, you know, a little uh, exacer exacer a little exaggerated. Excuse me. Uh, but the I IFRS is moving more and more towards fair value accounting. The financial accounting standards were in the US is, is heading that same way. So there's this train going down, going along. They have essentially abandoned now the idea of, of developing accounting standards for public companies that pay any attention to contracting. So these principles that used to be accounting principles like conservatism are gone now because they're not an unbiased estimate, they're downward biased. So we just wonder, you know, they've got to get it right. The, the competition is, the US uh, and the FASB now kind of rule the world, and they're both on the same page. They're both kind of doing the same accounting. There's convergence there. Okay, I've uh, talked for over an hour, so let me uh, open the floor up to questions. Yeah. So if the Americans, the USA, and the rest of the world, as I might call them now, say that once more. Um, if the USA and the rest of the world have two accounting standards and mm -hmm. they're converging, mm -hmm. why don't we have one accounting standard then? I mean, like, if they're converging and they're basically doing the same thing, wouldn't it be the most reasonable thing to have one accounting standard? I, I don't doubt that it would be the most reasonable thing, but you know, people are never aren't necessarily reasonable, right? I mean, <laughs> so why do you think the reasonable outcome would be the one that would happen? I don't know, but anyway, no. I, but but seriously, I you know, the U.S. was on track. There was a they, they call it a roadmap. Was it? I'm looking at Ming Yi. The roadmap to IFRS adoption. This was by uh, Christopher Cox, who used to be the chairman of the SEC. You know, this was back in the early 2000s, or around, the, around after 2005, 2006. There was a roadmap the US was gonna start adopting, and they're, and they're gonna adopt. And it was just, it was gonna happen. It's in writing, the you know, chairman of the SEC, the, the head of the FASB was saying, yes, we should adopt I IFRS. We, you know, We'll stand back. This is the right thing to do. You, know, you go to conferences and people get up and make you know, passionate speeches about this. Then the financial crisis happened in, around the world, 2008. Christopher Cox was no longer uh, head of the SEC, and it now was a back burner issue. And we, I mean, arguably, we have the rise of populism. Right? Are we, do we want to adopt a, I mean, who sets the accounting standard of the ISB? They're, you know where they are? They're in London. They're not Americans. 
Now, they're heavily, heavily influenced by America, yeah. right? I mean, lots of America. I mean, they're getting be less, I think, but they are 14 members. And, it, and it's very Western standards, right? That was one criticism of it. But, but the idea is, I mean, then, then you had people after the, the crisis saying, you know, why would we give up sovereignty over our accounting standards? That's so important part of, you know, our, we have the best capital markets in the world. We have the largest capital market in the world. It's larger than the other nine, next nine put together. Right, so I mean, it's huge. So basically, people are saying we just don't need. We, we will develop our own. Okay, if you guys want to adopt ours, that's fine. But right, it's like the metric system, I guess. I, you know, so there's just the, the little. That's that's America. <laughs> At least right now. Yeah. So if a U.S. company wants to list on like the Japanese stock exchange or one of these countries that the IFRS, do they have to adopt those standards? Oh. Uh, Japan, did you know about Japan, Mingi? I, uh, I think the question was, if the US company wants to list in Japan, do they have to use Japanese? Japanese have adopted, right? Are they going to adopt? Not 100% mandatory. In Japan? Uh, in the transition period. But that's, well, I'm not exactly sure, but I think Japan is more lenient in terms of foreign companies. So there are grades of adopting IFRS. That 138 I told you was companies countries that have adopted. Then there's a bunch of countries that allow. You know, in other words, you, 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 know, you, you don't have to use them, but we allow them. The U.S. is out here saying, if you're a U.S. company, no, you've got to use U.S. GAAP. If you're a foreign company, you can use IFRS. Big debate among companies in, in, in the U.S. Walmart lobbies like crazy to, for IFRS adoption because they're all over the world. All of their other financial statements are in IFRS. So every time they put together a financial, they have to convert everything else and put it into, right? So a big hassle for them. But then you've got other countries, and then there's even discussion that other countries are lobbying not to adopt IFRS because it'll hurt Walmart, their competitors, and they don't have as much international business, right? So there's a lot of strategy or gaming. But I'm not sure I answered your question about Japan. No, I mean, so... You, you gave the example where if, uh, if a company wants to list on the New York Stock Exchange, they have to use some standards that, that they use. So if a U.S. company was going to Europe or Japan or one of these countries that uses IFRS, do they need to use that standard as, as well? I, I think it sounds like it. it Not necessarily, no. It, it depends on that, that country. But, but I think most of them allow IFRS, right? Allow at least. Also, I mean, is there a reason why, like... Like, uh, they would have, you, want, you want a country specific accounting standard like Germany, maybe because they're large exporters, they, they undervalue or they, they overvalue their, their companies. Is there? Well, no, I mean, there's, there's some pretty convincing stories about why there was that big difference. And, and there were stories about a market oriented economy versus more of a relationship-oriented or just other objectives. It's kind of a socialist thing. So in Germany, they were interested in the large corporations paying taxes, hiring workers, giving those workers raises, and all of that depended on, you know, let's report the right income to make sure that happens. As opposed to my objective is to inform investors and have this efficient resource allocation. Just a different objective. Right, a different objective on how to, I guess, how to have, how to allocate resources, I suppose. So they had a lot of reserves. Basically, there's a lot of reserves. So they just smooth earnings every year. They kind of just wanted status quo. So Mark, I have an ideological viewpoint. You call the accounting the language of business, right? We have lots, of, and we have lots of languages in the world, and no one except some crazies uh, say that we should just have one world language. I agree. Right? All we need is a good translator, and there are great apps these days, <laughs> and very little is lost in translation. So I think there's something to be said on having different standards and competition is good. Yeah, so I mean, free. well, I mean, that's kind of why I put it up here. I, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's really great to have one standard setter, as long as you're doing what you like. <laughs> It's like a dictator, right? It's great. As long as they're benevolent and doing exactly what I want. But if they go wrong. And I think, so, I mean, yeah, I think this is, a lot of people argue that, that this is not the right, you know, we should have competition. Now, I mean, and I guess I'd push back a little bit and say, 
I guess it depends on kind of how much competition. I, I mean, I think local standards, you know, could be explained historically by development like in, in Germany and that sort of thing, but it doesn't mean it's the optimal standard necessarily for the, you know, social welfare. So having some change might make sense. But if the market is, uh sets the right incentives, and they find that the local standards are not bringing in money, they will voluntarily change their standards. Yeah, I guess, I guess the question there, are there transaction costs that get in the way of them having the right incentives, right? Is it, does it all map into it? Like so I have that? another question, which is the yeah. dark side. What's it, what? <laughs> so you said that accounting matters. You, I said... It does matter. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, that's assumed. I said, why it matters. And you quoted Mingi's research saying that if accounting earnings change, stock prices change too much. Mm -hmm. But there's a dirty little secret in accounting. It doesn't change that much. R squared is what? Two percent? One percent? Oh, I think it's very high. Very high? But R squared, if you're looking at long-term uh, association tests, yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you, okay, I, I think what you're talking about. Yeah, you're, you're talking about like uh, the earnings announcement, how much it, yeah. Yeah, but see, that's information arrival. That's expectations, right? In other words, I, I'm, I'm the investor, and the, the company has been tell, you know, walking me, you know, guiding me towards what the number should be. So by the time it comes out, it's already in the price. So if you open up that window and you look at the association of stock prices, then you get a pretty decent R squared. And I mean, it, it, the longer you go, I mean, it, theoretically or conceptually, they kind of have to be the same over the life of the company. Accounting earnings measures free cash flows. It just puts them in different spots, right? So still, they're measuring the same thing. It's just when they happen. So those dividends are really those earnings. That's what companies have available to pay for dividend. So I agree with you on any given day, but that's, that's just information, right, though? Association. Yeah. Um, my question is, like, how can accounting standards be changed to prevent more frauds from happening? Like what are solutions? Is it more about the principle itself or more about the institutions or corporate government? God, you know, you're asking the, you know, million dollar question there. What, how do you fix the world? How, you know, uh, you know this, this thing about these accounting frauds is, you know, we haven't had one, you know, lately. But, I, you know, if I, I wouldn't surprise me if I looked at the news and there was something going on. Uh, I mentioned auditing. I think, you know, auditing, this is a big part of this, right? These are the watchdogs. These are the gatekeepers. These are the, the group that, 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 that should be, you know, looking over the shoulder. Um, and I think it's pretty, pretty clear that the auditing profession or the, the, in specific cases has not done what they should be doing. So I think some improvement in, in, in the auditing would certainly be a good place to to think about, and I think this is what people are thinking about it. People are are trying to do. So after Sarbanes Oxley in 2002, in response to a couple of those big uh, 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 crashes uh, or, or big frauds, Sarbanes Oxley created something called the PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which now regulates the auditing profession in the U.S. I mean, it's kind of a loose regulation, but they certainly regulate it, and they have all these inspectors that go in and audit the auditors. So. Like I said, we haven't had a you know big fraud in a while. Maybe that has something to do with it. I think time will tell, and more evidence will, has to be gathered. But uh, yeah, I know. I think everybody wants to stop uh, major frauds. Yeah, there's incentives, a lot of money to be made, and uh, you know, so people will do bad things. So we just need you know systems in place to curtail that as, to the extent we can. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, you being here, and uh, thank you very much.